So, uh, Vivian is asking a question that is in response to a video we did last week where we discussed some of the um, distinctions between those saved during the tribulation, or we typically call the tribulation saints, uh, and the uh, bride of Christ. And so, uh, out of that uh, discussion came this question, and it's a great one. It's actually kind of the question of the ages in regard to those who have never heard. Uh, and it basically, I'm paraphrasing, goes like this. Um, you know, during the time of the tribulation, uh, similarly to the time uh, when Jesus was on the earth, the idea of the gospel and responding to it was um, uh, much easier to do be, in terms of just its availability. The idea, not that there wasn't persecution, but in terms of its availability, during those periods of time, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot going on. And so the idea of coming to Christ during those times uh, would seem to be much more prevalent. But what about those who have never heard? What about those uh, to where the gospel doesn't seem to come? You know, what, uh, you know, what happens to those people who maybe don't have a chance, uh, you know, to hear the gospel? And, you know, it, it, variously that question is asked. You know, what about the, uh, you know, the person in the deep, dark continent somewhere that, you know, never had a missionary show up or something like that? Uh, it's a common question and a, and a fair one, by the way, too. Um, I've heard it oftentimes uh, from unbelievers who really question um, the narrowness of the idea of Christ being, uh, Jesus Christ being the only way and, you know, the fairness of God in terms of those who, you know, maybe are, don't live in a, uh, a society where the gospel can be proclaimed as easily and that kind of thing. And so, you know, what about those who've never heard is essentially what it boils down to. Uh, and, and, you know, for many, this is a very tough question, I, I think, uh, to answer. It, it seems as though um, there are people that are left out, and that just seems inherently unfair in regard to the goodness and grace of God and this kind of thing. And so, you know, does that mean that people are saved outside of the gospel, and that, so to speak? Well, I would simply say this. It's always the best thing to go to Scripture to try and find answers for questions uh, that we have about our faith. And this, of course, is a question that is no exception. So, thankfully, uh, I believe there is a passage that really does specifically anticipate uh, this very dilemma. And it's found in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 25 and 26, or 26 and 27. I'll put it in the notes. But it's in Acts chapter 17. And if you're familiar with the chapter, Acts, uh, Paul is uh, on uh, one of his missionary journeys, and he goes to Thessalonica, and in those three Sabbaths, he plants a church and, and, uh, and all of this. Then he moves on, he sees, he's driven out of Thessalonica, and he ends up going to Berea. And his time with the Bereans uh, is rich as well. As a matter of fact, from that uh, encounter, we get one of the great passages in the New Testament that uh, encourages us to make sure that we don't just take for granted the things that we're taught, but we test teachers and consider what they teach us. When the Bereans, or those Jews in Berea, are said to have been of even more noble character than those in Thessalonica, which by the way is really saying something, um, they're of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, in that they received what Paul taught them, what he said to them with all gladness and readiness of heart, Yet, they also uh, check those things against the scripture to make sure that the things that Paul was teaching them were so. And so this is a, uh, that's Acts 17.11, which, as Chuck Missler famously would always say, make sure you write that at the top of your notebook, because that's the passage where Luke tells you not to believe anything Chuck Missler, or by extension, Brian Bichochen, uh says to you, but to check the scripture, uh, these things against the scripture, make sure whether they're so. So that's his time with the Bereans. Well, after Berea, he ends up going to Athens. And while he is waiting for some of his entourage uh, to join him, he goes to Mars Hill. Now at Mars Hill, he finds there, uh, probably unsurprisingly, a group of philosophers who gather there to discuss all the new things that are going on, all the new ideas that are being purveyed. Um, you know, Athens, of course, a, a philosophical capital of the ancient world. And so Paul is there on Mars Hill, hearing these discussions between Epic and, uh, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and, and uh, people who gather there to discuss all these things. And uh, Paul notices that in their midst, there on uh, Mars Hill in the Areopagus, Areopagus, there is a series of these, you know, likely pedestals upon which are statues of these various gods within the Greek pantheon. And, uh, and so 
among those uh, pedestals is one that is marked out to the unknown God. Uh, and so it, it seems as though, with all of the gods that they were worshiping, that they sort of covered their bases by making sure that they had one set aside for one that you know was unnamed because it may be that they missed one or something. And that, you know, they're maybe what they're just trying to cover their bases. But whatever the case, Paul decides to key in on this pedestal. And he says, this, this one to the unknown God, it's, this is the one I'd like to tell you about. And he begins to go on to tell them uh, about the God of creation and all of these things. He ultimately ends up telling them about the resurrection, which really turns them off. But along the way, they call him a seed picker for, uh, which essentially means that he's somebody who is not necessarily philosophically astute himself, but rather somebody who just sort of picks and chooses uh, various things from various philosophies, tries to amalgamate them together, and then regurgitate them as though he were intelligent kind of thing. That's what they're accusing him of. It's an insult. And uh, however, little did they know that uh, for all of their philosophical musings, they're actually in the midst of somebody who's come representing the God of eternity, uh, who has created them, and Paul is telling them about their creator. And they, of course, don't recognize this necessarily, although some do get saved as a, at the end of this encounter. Uh, but, but a lot of them sort of just brush him off. But anyway, in the course of this discussion, uh, Paul says to them this very, very important and insightful truth that bears, uh, has bearing on what we're talking about here in regard to those who have never heard. Uh, he says in these verses, again, it's, it's right there in verses 25 to 27, where, uh, where Paul says that God who has created man has also determined his times and his places that he might seek him. Okay, the idea being that God has not only created people, but he has also determined the places that they would not only be born, but live and carry out their lives, and also the times in history in which they would inhabit. And the reason for that is given to us because that is the time when God has put them there because that's the time that they would seek him. That's the circumstance under which they would be most likely to seek him out. Uh, now, I, th I think that's wonderful. And again, I think it anticipates this very question. And I have used it oftentimes when answering this question. Uh, oftentimes, again, I think I mentioned earlier, but unbelievers will often challenge uh, the goodness of God and, and the narrowness of the idea of faith in Christ being Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, you know, and to bring this passage, which essentially says that, look, you know something, unbeliever who's asking me this question, not Vivian, obviously, but the person who might ask this question in unbelief, um, you can point them to this and say, well, the truth of the matter is, is that God has actually decided when you would be born and where you would be so that you would be most likely to seek him in that time. Now, of course, he seeks us first. He's the great initiator, but this is one of those passages that helps us understand some of the ways in which he initiates. He actually establishes our boundaries of our times and, and seasons, uh, and one of the reasons why he does this is because it's what gives us the opportunity then to uh, respond to him. And so nobody really is with excuse at all on Judgment Day. As a matter of fact, there's another passage in Revelation uh, where we see people uh, right after the 144,000 uh, are sealed as witnesses and that, although it never really says that they go out on an evangelistic crusade per se, but uh, juxtaposed to their sealing is this mention of, then I saw uh, myriad people from every tongue, tribe, and nation gathered around the throne. And so we surmise from that that these are the fruit of the ministry of the 144,000. Again, it's, it doesn't specifically say that, but it's, it's a reasonable uh, a reasonable connection to make. But in any case, however they got there, um, there, there they are. People from, note again, every tongue, tribe, and nation. Now, it's possible that that is speaking in broad, general terms. But you know me, if you've been watching or listening for any length of time, I don't generally make that assumption, but would rather first assume that the passage just simply means what it says, that people from every tongue, tribe, and nation are gathered around the throne, which is to say that God has saved people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so the question is a valid one, and it often springs from sort of an emotional sense of 
of, uh, of the narrowness of the gospel, which is unashamedly narrow. There is one way, which, by the way, is not an unreasonable thing. Uh, I use this example, by the way. I'm getting a little off, but maybe for the sake of the gospel, uh, let me just take a slight detour for a moment, a slight tangent. I use this example a lot at the nursing home on, uh, when we go visit there and do some, some ministry there. I will often say, you know, now, now God forbid this should ever happen, but suppose here we were sitting here and somewhere along the way for some reason a fire started and the whole building began to go up and suddenly smoke filled the room and we couldn't see anything and we were crawling around trying to find our way out of here, which is similar to what Paul actually says in chapter 17 of Acts. But we're groping around, looking around, crawling around, trying to find a way out of here. We can't seem to figure it out. But all of a sudden, a fireman kicks open the door. And he says, come this way if you want to live. Follow me if you want to live. Probably none of us in that circumstance would look at that fireman and say, you know something, sir? It's nice that you've made a way for us. But that's awfully narrow-minded of you to say this is the only way to safety. I would like to think that there's a, a number of ways, maybe 50 ways. Uh, or at least maybe your way and my way to, to get out of here. No, probably none of us would do that. We would grab onto that fireman's coat. We'd grab onto his boots. We would hold on to his leg. Uh, we would, whatever it took, get me out of here. I know that you, I trust you. You're the one who can save me from this. Well, don't you know that Jesus essentially kicked open the burning, uh, the door to the burning building that is this world and said, come with me if you want to live. Why on earth? What kind of a crazy person looks at that and says, no, I think I'll look for my own way. There is no other way. Thank God there is a way. It's not an argument about how many ways there are. There's one. Thank God there's that, right? And so, you know, when we talk about the narrowness of the gospel message, where Jesus uh, ultimately is the only way to eternal life by faith in him and his finished work. Uh, you know, when we say that, we say, well, what about people who never heard that? Well, I can't necessarily answer to every single person and how it is that God reaches them. But we do know from Scripture that, you know, God has put them in the best place that they would ever have to seek Him. And it would seem that literally from every tongue, tribe, and nation, there are people gathered around the throne. And so some of the particulars within that, based on each individual person and all of that, I leave that to the Lord. But I do know that no one loves the Lord greater than, no one loves the people, I should say, great more than the Lord does. Uh, certainly, Whatever my love for people is and wanting to see them saved, God's is certainly more. After all, it was God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so, um, you know, and on top of that, you know, there is this wonderful question that Abraham asks rhetorically about God when God is about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, uh, if you're familiar with the passage, you know that Abraham is sort of famously bartering with God. Well, wait a minute. What if there's a hundred righteous there? Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he kind of whittles his way all the way down to ten. And God is willing every time, uh, even down to ten, which essentially sums up about Lot and his family, Abraham's nephew. But, you know, God says, even if there's ten righteous, I won't judge the city for the sake of the righteous, those ten righteous. And, and along the way, Abraham asks the question, Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Well, he asks it rhetorically because obviously the answer to the question is yes, he will. And so, um, so anyway, so all of that said, uh, my, my hope is that that gives you some food for thought in regard to this question and bless you for your heart that is troubled at the prospect of someone not hearing the gospel and being lost. But trust me and trust the word of God actually that, uh, uh, yeah, don't, I mean, I'd like to think you trust me, but you should always trust the Word of God, um, that, you know, if anyone has a compassion and a desire to seek and save the lost, it is in fact the God uh, who created us uh, to know Him and to enjoy Him forever. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit and uh, helps to answer the question, at least gives you something to mull over a little bit. And uh, if, as, as always, if uh, any of you all have questions or comments or thoughts that you'd like to share, uh, you can do so once again. Uh, you can send me an email at info at calvarychapelfranklin.com. Or if you want to leave a comment in the comment section or, uh, you know, uh, if you're watching the YouTube channel or if you're on my website at parsonspad.com and you want to comment on one of the videos there, you can do that as well. Uh, if you go to my website, by the way, again, it's parsonspad.com. Uh, on the left side column, you also can choose to, if you like, to subscribe to the audio version of these 
Uh, I know that, uh, boy, these videos are gangbusters, and you don't want to miss all the graphics and crazy stuff that we put up on the screen. Actually, I'm kidding. We don't do anything. This is me sitting in front of my phone. But, uh, but, but you know, if you want to just get the audio version for whatever reason, you can do that and just subscribe. Uh, you can link to that off of our uh, off the website. So thanks again for watching, and uh, thanks for joining. And if you happen to be passing through Nashville and you want to swing by Calvary Chapel Franklin on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you come pay us a visit. Make sure you say hello if you do. So God bless you, and thanks for watching and listening. And Father, we thank you that you are the one who is rich in compassion. Uh, slow in anger, abundant in grace and mercy, and how we are thankful that your desire is not to destroy, but ultimately to save, even as Jesus himself said in John 3. We're very thankful that your desire is for, uh, for us to be saved and to know you and to know you well and to look forward to seeing you face to face one day when we stand before you at your throne. And so, Father, we thank you for your word and the promises, the hope, the answers to hard questions that, that you've given us therein. We thank you, Father, that there's uh, not a one of us that you don't love and care about. And so we just pray that, Father, in our days, in the uh, times that we have left before Jesus comes for us, that we would be about your business, that we too would share that heart of compassion and desire to see people come and be saved. And so thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you and bless you. Uh, that Jesus, in fact, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God so thank you, Lord, that you have not asked us to do some great, incredible feat of devotion, but rather you've invited us to believe, to trust, that when Jesus died for our sins on the cross, he was buried, he rose again the third day, that we would believe you that that is in fact sufficient. That is your way of setting us free, not ourselves, but rather it's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So thank you, Father, for this. We love you and praise you, and ask all of this in Jesus' name.